say a couple words before I start singing. Um, you know how your best friend ha happened to be my wife. A uh, number of years ago, she said I sang with a group of guys, and and uh, I'm not the best talker in the whole world. And she said, she said, you know, she said you your singing's all right, I guess, but you might leave public speaking to the other guys. So, <laughs> so I'll try not to say too much, but but you know the the decisions that we make in everyday life have consequences, good and bad, of course. And uh, one of the one of the good decisions I made uh, 60 years ago was I met, I met a nice young lady. She's not here today because we, I wore her out yesterday to drag her to Lawrence and back to a high school graduation thing. But anyhow, I married that same gal 58 years ago. And uh, ever since that time, I've been so darn aggravated that I wasted two full years. <laughs> and that still ir irks me, you know. But, but anyhow, the, the question we have the question we have, what are we going to do with Jesus? And this song uh, is, is what I hope I am doing with Jesus. <clears throat> Amen and amen, Brother Dale. Uh, before the kids get out of here, I just want to say a word. Uh, attended graduation yesterday. 
And it's always interesting to hear the speeches that happen in a, a school auditorium like that on a graduation day and see what the kids will say about life and about the future. And let me give you two of the wisest things that were said yesterday. Um, Savannah, I think her last name is Stroot. She said, kids, young people, she said, it doesn't matter. The question is not what you want to be when you get out of high school, but who you want to be. I thought that was pretty, pretty wise. It doesn't matter what you do with your life, but it matters who you are, whatever you're doing in life. And then the second thing, old Nolan Denton, he ended the prayer in Jesus' name. Only mention of Jesus in the entire place. Uh, kids, if you ever get an opportunity to take a platform like this, whether it's at the school or whether it's anywhere in the public, you guarantee we're mentioning Jesus' name because we're about Jesus. Uh, you can be dismissed for Sunday school. Okay, church, last, last book of the Bible, we're going to make it easy, last book of your Bible, the book of Revelation, Brother Larry, I was talking with him the other day, and he said, it's a, that's, a, that's an undertaking, and uh, we have an amazing God who I think is going to do some amazing things in this book. Uh, Revelation chapter 1. A message entitled, Revelation Revealed. This will be the introduction to the letter. There will be some uh, nitty-gritty things that we got to deal with. There's, it's going to be a combination of teaching and preaching, and you will definitely probably see the difference in the two, but they will prayerfully be blended together as we do this introduction and then get into it. Let's begin Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Let's stand to honor the word of God as we look into this prophetic book of the Bible. Verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have just read that there is a blessing to be had by reading by hearing, and by keeping the words of this book. And we pray this morning that you would pour out a blessing upon your people, Lord, that you would reveal to us more of Jesus Christ through this amazing book. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. There was a survey taken of church members, and they said, to the church members, what is the book that you want to hear preached the most? And guess what book that was? The book of Revelation. The same survey was taken of pastors. Pastors, which book would you rather not ever preach out of? It was the book of Revelation. <laughs> because you guessed it, Revelation has caused so much controversy, it has sparked so much sensationalism, and it has created so much division within the body of Christ. Even the great Martin Luther, this is Martin Luther, he said this about the book, that revelation should be banished from the New Testament. Because the thing is so wild and so extreme that we rather just sort of just scoot this thing to the side and not deal with it. Another person said comically this, and maybe it's true, I don't know. Revelation 
either finds a man mad or it leaves him so. Hmm. My prayer as we begin this study is that it doesn't create madness, that it doesn't create confusion, but rather it brings to us a fresh revelation of Jesus Christ in all of his wonder, all of his glory, and all of his power. And my prayer, as I started praying this for the church weeks and weeks ago, that this would spark a revival in our hearts, guys. We need that in the church of Jesus Christ. And I think this book is the book to do it with that a revival to take place within the congregation, within our own hearts. How do we do that? There's a couple keys I believe we have to think about. And the number one key is this, how we approach this book. We have to approach this book. This is the key for me, and I believe for you, to unlock this book. We approach this book humbly, humbly. Warren Wiersbe said this, that we must approach this book as wanderers and worshipers, not as academic students. I want you to look at this book as we go through it as a wonder and a worshiper, not just something to try to dissect and try to mitigate and put formulas to. Does it mean we're going to check our brains at the door? Absolutely not. But I want us to come into this book with an awe and with a wonder. Three things I want to look at with you through the introduction to this book. Unveiling the mystery of Revelation, unveiling the majesty of Revelation, and unveiling the meaning of Revelation. Three things I want to consider with you this morning. Let's first begin with unveiling the mystery of Revelation. This book is mysterious, no doubt. If you have let me see. How many read through this book? Yeah, it's pretty wild. Okay. Why is there so much? We don't really want to deal with this book. I think, number one, the devil doesn't want you to deal with this book. Because right off the bat, you see what happens is there's a blessing in verse 3. No other book in the Bible begins with a blessing like this. It, the blessing is for the readers, the hearers, and the keepers of this book, right off the bat. So if you read the book, as we're doing, from the pulpit, and you are hearing it, and you desire to keep it, he said, you're going to be happy. Oh, happy is the man. How blessed is the man. How blessed is the woman. And I think the devil wants to keep us from this book because of what it reveals. Verse 1. Ready? The revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation. A lot of people say, well, it's the book of revelations. It's not the book of revelations. It's the book of the revelation. It is singular. It is one revelation. And the Holy Spirit has put it before our eyes, not to cover up things and to hide things and make things mysterious, but rather to uncover and to reveal mainly one thing, and that's the person of Jesus Christ. So let's look at a couple reasons. Before we get into it, I have to go through this, guys, with you to grab a better understanding of this book. Why is it misunderstood? Number one, this book has been sensationalized by the world, the media, and the church. You have movies, you have documents, and I hate to say it, you have wackos out there writing books like, do you remember... Uh, 88 reasons why Jesus will come back in 1988. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's 88 reasons. How about Adolf Hitler in World War II? He was the Antichrist. And then when the Gulf War happened, oh, this is, this is the area of the Armageddon. This is the Battle of the Armageddon. Here we go, Book of Revelation. There's a sensationalism about this book. Secondly, why is it mysterious? It's the type of literature that we're reading. This is what we call apocalyptic literature. And apocalyptic simply means to uncover. You don't read, and I don't read this type of stuff on a daily basis. This isn't a book that you usually just pick up and you start peeling through. It's a different type of literature. Let me give you an example. If I began a story like this, once upon a time, you would understand 
that what I'm about to tell you is a fairy tale. And a fairy tale has certain rules that apply to that type of literature. I'm not saying this is a fairy tale, but I'm saying that it's apocalyptic in nature. And when you look at apocalyptic uh, literature, certain rules apply to that literature. Again, we have to understand what we are reading. Thirdly, we are hit with symbols, numbers, and colors. I mean, you're bombarded by numbers and all these colors and all these imagery pictures. Uh, Jesus is said to have feet like brownish uh, bronze and hair white as wool, and he holds keys, and people are depicted as these crazy beasts. Again, something that we're not used to. Numbers are huge in this book. The number three. The number three is the number of God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you will see, I've been seeing this as I've been studying through this like never before, triplets. This book has a cadence like this, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And literally it becomes easy to memorize. You could literally memorize this whole book because of the cadence in this book. Number four is a big number. It's the number of creation. And you see quartets exploding. You have four corners. You have four angels. You have four living creatures. You have people saved from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, and every people. Four is a big number in this book. And then the number seven. The number seven is the number of completion or number of perfection. You have seven churches, seven lampstands, seven spirits, seven stars, seven horns, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. Actually, 49 times the number seven, seven times seven. You get the picture. It's a big deal in the book of Revelation. And 12. 12 is the number of God's people. You have 12 apostles, 12 tribes, 12 stars above the woman's head. And then you have multiples of these numbers, 12 times 12 times 1,000 is 144,000. 144,000 witnesses will be taking the scene later in the book. And then the fourth reason why this is so difficult to understand is the Old Testament references in the book. If you are unfamiliar with the Old Testament, it will be harder to understand the book of Revelation there is no less than 500 allusions to the Old Testament in this book. And then fifthly, this is where we're going to dig a little bit deeper. We've got to put the Bible study hat on for a moment. And I think I have, forget if I have it on the board. I think I have it on the board. There are four interpretations to this book that people use. I will go through them briefly, but I think we need to understand how do we interpret this book? The first view is what we call the preterist view. The preterist view, it comes from the word praetor, and it means past. Very simply put, this is what it means. The people who take this view view this. Everything in the book of Revelation has already taken place. It's done. First century, it's done. It's already happened. A lot of Roman Catholics take this view. That's the preterist. Historical view, number two, says this book depict, depicts different eras of church history, beginning with the first church and leading up till the end. Again, and you can imagine how people decipher and they, they divide about, hey, are, what era of this church do you think this is? Or what era of the church do you think this is? Maybe someone has even asked you this question. Hey, do you think we're in the Laodicean era of the church? You've probably heard something like that. That's the historical view of Revelation. And then you have, thirdly, the idealist view. And this basically spiritualizes the entire book of Revelation. It becomes one big allegory of, you know, symbolism, saying this is one big cosmic battle between good and evil, and there's no literal fulfillment in the book whatsoever. It's just a great big picture. And then finally, the one that we will be using, and I believe it is the best and makes the most sense, is the futurist view. And the futurist view says this. Some things have taken place, 
but most of it is to take place in the future. Well, what is to take, where do you decipher that? Got your Bibles? I hope you have your Bibles. Revelation chapter 1, let me jump down to verse 19. If you have your Bible, look at verse 19. I believe the Holy Spirit actually gives you an outline of the book within the book, chapter 1, verse 19. Look at that. He says to John, Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The Greek word there is metatata. Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place. Okay, let's ex- ask, ask some questions. What are the things you have seen? That's chapter one. He's going to see the glorified, risen Jesus Christ. Second question, what are the things which are? That is chapters two and three. The seven churches, the church age, and the things which will take place after this, chapters 4 to 22. So chapter 1, the things which you have seen, chapters 2 and 3, the things which are, and chapters 4 to 22, the things which will take place after this. And again, I believe this has massive application for us. That is the mystery of Revelation. Why is it so complicated? For all the reasons I just said. So what's the meaning of Revelation? That's the question, right? But let's put all those crazy details to the side. What is the meaning? Again, humility is the key to understanding them. What I want us to do as a congregation is this. Don't get tangled in the web of numbers, colors, pictures. Okay? Have you ever looked at a picture, maybe you're, I don't know, and you're looking at it close and it doesn't make any sense to you, and then as you pull it further away, you're like, oh, well, that, make, that makes sense, that's clear. That's what I want us to do with the book of Revelation. You can't get lost in all the colors and all the meanings and all the symbols. You have to pull yourself off the page a little bit and look at it from the big picture, and you can see its beauty and see its glory when you pull off the page a little bit. Somebody said this. I like this. Listen, Revelation is not a puzzle book to figure out. Rather, it's a picture book to unfold. It's not this puzzle and enigma that we have to try to figure out. Rather, it's a picture book that we are to unfold. What does Revelation reveal? Yes, it reveals God's judgments. Yes, it reveals what will happen at the end of the time. But I want you to get this, church. If you get one thing and one thing only, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is where it becomes interactive. Ready? Who does this book uncover, church? That's right. Who does this book reveal, church? Who does this book disclose, church? That's right. Jesus, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. This book has the highest Christology of any other book in your Bible. Jesus is no longer the suffering servant carrying the cross. No, Jesus is the reigning king carrying the scepter in this book. We get a full glimpse of all the majesty and all the power and all the glory of Jesus. Charles Spurgeon. The prince of preachers said about this book, listen to this. He said, Jesus becomes more than a historical historical personage that lived years ago whose deeds by which we are saved and we admire. Oh no, it is here Jesus becomes a living, present, bright reality. Don't you want that in your life? I want that in my life. Jesus is a living, present, bright reality. Why are we studying this book? Because of that. Because it's in the book of Revelation, church. Jesus is revealed as the faithful and true witness. He is revealed as the 
firstborn from the dead. It's in the book of Revelation that he is the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. In this book, he is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. In Revelation, he's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. In the book of Revelation, he's the bright and morning star. In the book of Revelation, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And Jesus is coming again. That's what the book of Revelation says to us, church. Two main purposes of this book. Two rails. Think about the rails that will keep us aligned are these. Number one, it describes his triumphant return. Rail number two, it describes his victorious rule. Those are the two rails that will keep us in line as we go through this book. You say, Pastor, can you give me the central theme to the book of Revelation? And a lot of people would say, yeah, it's judgment. This time I'm going through this book and you know what's coming up? The theme of the book of Revelation is worship. It's worship. It should create worship in our hearts. You say, give me one verse, Pastor, that summarizes this book. I'll give you Revelation 5, 12. It says, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive glory, honor, power, riches, and strength forevermore. That's the theme of the book of Revelation. What's the message? It's simple. That God is in control and he will triumph in the end. That is the simple message of this book. And I was talking, I think, Doug the other day. He said, you know, I really don't see that as a book of just chaos anymore or something like that. And that's what I want you to think of it as. Not as a book of catastrophe, but a book of comfort. Not a book of horror, but a book of hope. What are you going through today? What pain? What indignity? What are you suffering through today? What brokenness? What are you weeping over in your heart of hearts that nobody knows about? What sword, so to speak, is piercing your soul The book of Revelation is a reminder to you and to me that the struggles of this life are temporary, that there is hope beyond the grave. And Revelation chapter 21 tells us of a place, I call it the place of no mores. There is no more crying. There is no more pain. There is no more death. There is no more cancer. There is no more broken bones. There is no more heart disease. There is no more war. There is no more family strife. It's the place of no mores. The book of Revelation tells us about it. That's why we pray this prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In the book of Revelation. We've seen the mystery. We've seen the meaning. It's about. Now, let's look at the majesty, shall we? Let's look. If you have your Bible still open, the majesty of Revelation in verses 4. Let's start to dig into this. Ready? John, verse 4, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. All right, we have a greeting. We have an introduction. It's going to the seven churches. We'll get to that in a bit in a few weeks. I'm not going to touch that right now. But I want you to notice this morning, who is it from? Okay, it's coming from John. And then it goes, grace to you and peace. Check this out. From the triune God. Father, Spirit, Son. Him who is and was and who is to come. Who's that? That's God Almighty. Yahweh, Jehovah God, the everlasting one from beginning. He has no beginning. He has no end. That's God. The seven spirits. Seven, the number of perfection. It is the Holy Spirit. And then from Jesus Christ, Father, Spirit, Son. Three. Three and one. It's coming from the triune God. And what is it going to reveal? Here's the majesty. 
it reveals to us three things this morning. Who Jesus is, what Jesus did for us, and what Jesus will do. Let's focus on the first two. Who Jesus is. Here's the majesty of the book. It says here, number one, that Jesus is, in verse 5, the faithful witness. I like that. He's the faithful witness. He's not an unfaithful witness. This establishes Jesus' authority, his credibility. Why did Jesus come to the earth? To save sinners? Absolutely. But he also came to reveal the Father. Did he not? He said in the Gospel of John, he said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. He revealed God to us. He was God in the flesh. God's love. God's grace. God's truth. God's goodness. God's mercy revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. And he did it, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, it says he, he did it to the point of death. He's a faithful witness. Think about Jesus for a moment. There he is on Pilate's Hall, a be beaten, crowned, robed, accused. He would not budge. He would not move. He's the faithful witness. Do you know in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible says that we are his witnesses? We are witnesses. You are a witness. You don't have to go witnessing. You are a witness. The question for you and me is this this morning. What type of witness am I? Am I a marginal witness? Am I a part-time witness? Am I a Sunday morning witness? Or is my life a witness that I serve the living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Is my marriage a witness? Is my friendship so, are my friendships a witness? Is my service a witness? Is what, how I operate at work a witness? What kind of witness am I? The thing we are living for, and I always tell Debbie, she, the Holy Spirit works in these bulletins. She always puts something in there that's in the sermon. Well, some of your bulletin covers, it says, well done, good and faithful servant. What are we living for? Are we living for, as Brother Dale just sang, are you living for the praise of men? Or are you living to hear these words? Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the house of the Lord. That's what we're living for. Jesus is the faithful witness. He wasn't ashamed of you. He wasn't ashamed of me to die on that cross before humanity. We cannot be ashamed of him. And that's why I tell the young people, hey, you get a platform, I'm screaming Jesus. Hey, I remember a pastor told me the other, it was a pastor a while back, he said, I was called to city council. They said they wanted me to say a prayer. And, but they said, don't mention Jesus' name, do God because God's real generic. We don't know what God we're talking about. And he said, you know what I did? I said, he said, I smothered that prayer with Jesus. I, I, I dropped Jesus' name like 10 times in that prayer. That's right. Because there's one mediator between God and man. That's the man Christ Jesus. Jesus is Lord. He's the faithful witness. Second thing, Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. <laughs> How about that? Firstborn from the dead. Jesus is superior to all, all. This, this firstborn is not chronological order. It's preeminence. It's high authority. He's over all. Jesus was the only one to rise from the dead, never to die again. There was other people who rose from the dead, but they died again in your Bible. But Jesus never died. Think about it. Mohammed, he's buried in Medina. Buddha, buried. Charles Darwin, Westminster Abbey. There you can, go, you can go to his grave. Krishna, dead. All the religious gurus of the day are dead. But Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is alive forevermore, and that separates him from every other person who has ever come in their name or his name. Think about it. Do you know, I didn't, I didn't realize what a lot of Buddhists do. They have a tooth of Buddha, and they just worship this thing. They think it's from Buddha. We don't worship a dead tooth. We worship a, a living God who rules and reigns, who's the creator and maker of life. 
who gives breath to everything. That's who we worship. Jesus said even himself in John chapter 11, verse 25, when those two poor ladies were weeping over their loved one, Lazarus, he said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And whoever believes in me, even though he dies, he shall live. Do you believe this? Question. Do you believe this? You know, these people who say they're atheists and agnostics and whatever else you want to call yourself, that's all great and fine when everything is smooth sailing. But when you stand over the coffin of a child, what are you going to do? It's just what it is. It's just what it is. Friends, Jesus said it's not just what it is. He said there is life after death, and I've proved that there is life after death by rising from the grave because I am the firstborn from the dead. This is the book of Revelation. Thirdly, check this out. It gets even better. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. This is establishes Jesus' sovereignty over every single king of the earth. Jesus rules. And you're going to see it. He is going to put every enemy underneath his feet. And he will rule and reign, the Bible says. Question, what enemy are you facing today? Is it the enemy of temptation? Jesus rules over it. Is it the enemy of discouragement? Jesus reigns over it. Is it the enemy of fear? Jesus rules over it. Revelation eleven fifteen. This is personally my favorite verse out of Revelation eleven fifteen. It says, "The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever." Amen. Amen. Daniel chapter two. Daniel and Revelation. Two good books to go together if you need some reading. Daniel chapter two. Daniel chapter 2, that crazy statue that he saw, Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, you know, gold, silver, bronze, and then you get down to the feet. If you remember the feet, 10 toes of iron mixed with clay, very similar to a revived Roman Empire, remember? Hmm? The iron was Rome. Now we have this revived Roman Empire and these two 10 toes of clay, and what happens to those toes? There's a rock that comes, not cut with human hands, and it smashes those toes to oblivion, and it says that rock fills the entire earth. That rock is the kingdom of Jesus, and it one day will fill the entire earth and will crush every kingdom of man forever. Think about it. Putin is Jesus rules over. Kim Jong-un, Jesus rules over. Biden Jesus rules over. Any Caesar that you can think of, Jesus, it says here, is the ruler over the kings of the earth. And the Bible tells us that one day, one day, church, every, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Biden is not Lord. Donald Trump is not Lord. Putin is not Lord. Jesus Christ. Christ is Lord. That's what the Bible says. That's what the book of Revelation is telling us. That's who Jesus is. What did Jesus, now this, what, what Jesus did, this is the majesty of it. Look there. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Is this a good book? I think so. It says, he loved you, he washed you, and he made you. He loved you, he washed you, and he made you. I want you to know today that God loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. He loved you before you could even love him. He loved you when there was nothing in us to love. He loved you, it says, the Bible says, while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't just say he loved us. 
He demonstrated he loved us by going to the cross, pouring out his life. Jesus said in John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this, than one laid down his life for his friends, and he laid down his life for you. And whenever you doubt, whenever the enemy starts chirping in your ear, hey, you messed up. Hey, God can't love you. You're, no, 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 there's no way he's going to stop loving you. You tell them no. You tell him no. Jesus Christ has loved me, he is loving me, and he always will love me. That's what the Bible declares. That's not Pastor Derek, that's Romans chapter 8. It says nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Not my sin, not his sin, not their sin, not the world, not the devil, not heaven, not hell, not my thoughts, not my feelings, not anything in this world can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So when the devil starts chirping, God doesn't love you, you go to the scripture and you say, listen, devil, it is written in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 to 39, that God said nothing can separate me from that love. You start quoting scripture to the devil. You start having Bible study with the devil. He loved you. And then look at this. He loosed you. He washed you. Washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's love. That love cost him his life. Look at, the, look at it first. Look at the order. He loved you, number one, and then he washed you. It's not he washed you and then loved you. No, he loved you. And then he washed you. People think, oh, man, I got to get my life right. I got to get this cleaned up, and I got to get that cleaned up. And then I'll come to Jesus. No, no, that's the wrong order. You come to Jesus with all the junk, all the baggage, with all the dirt, with all the junk. Listen, you come to Jesus with all that, and guess what he's going to do? He's going to wash you. He's going to wash you in his own blood. That's what we're singing about today. Have you been washed in the blood of the lamb? You think Ty can get things clean? Listen, the blood of the lamb can wash you as white, as white as snow. And here's the thing I love about Jesus. He's not going to throw you out. He's not going to throw you out when you mess up. Listen, your spouse might throw you out. Your job might throw you out. Your friends might throw you out. Your community might throw you out. But Jesus will never throw you out. And that is so freeing, isn't it? Is that freeing to you? I think it's freeing. And the Bible says, who the sun sets free is free indeed. I don't know. I hope you're free today. I hope you're washed in the blood today because I'm going to give you an opportunity before this service is ended to give your life to Jesus Christ and you can be washed. You can be set free. You can experience more of his love. And then lastly, okay, he loved you. He washed you and he made you. Look at this. This is deep. Kings and priests. Kings and priests. He's speaking here of a future glory of heaven where you're going to rule and we're going to rule and reign with him. I don't know exactly what that looks like. It just says what it says. But here's the thing. Do you know that the Bible says that we are also priests right now? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 says, you are a holy priesthood. What does a priesthood do? It brings people to, the, to God. It represents God to the folks. That's your job. That's my job. Not just from a pulpit, but in your daily life, are you representing Almighty God to people? Saying, this is how you can be reconciled to God. This is how you can be made right with God. You know what I love? I love, this, I love Jesus and his words in Mark chapter 4. You remember that? When he's talking to the disciples, and he says, I will make you. Fishers of men. I don't got to make myself a fisher of men. He's going to make me a fisher of men. He's going to, I'm not, look, by nature, Pastor Derek is not a fisher of men. By nature, he's not a king, nor is he a priest. But with Jesus working in me and through his strength and through his power, look, I am a fisher of men. I am a king. I am a priest. This is the majesty of the book of Revelation. Hey, who's Jesus? What has, we, what has been revealed so far? We're only a few verses in. What has this revealed to us? That Jesus is the faithful witness. That Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. 
that Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth? What has it revealed that Jesus has done for us? Jesus has loved us. Jesus has washed us. Jesus has lifted us. And last thing, and this is what we'll pick up next week, what Jesus will do. Verse 7, this is where we'll end. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. What's Jesus going to do? He's going to come again. He's going to come again. Hey, the book of Revelation, it's mysterious. The book has a lot of meaning, but most of all, the book has a lot of majesty. And the majesty comes from Jesus. And as the worship team comes up, we sing this last song of invitation. I told, I told Levi,